Okay, so accessibility in practice. Lesson one, uh, visually impaired people don't see the tiny little timers, so they used your own. Ac now, first slide, oh great, wait, so I'll move slightly so you can see it as well. Accessible charts and graphs. Well, first things first. Oh, if I could have the next slide, please, because no one gave me the switch. Lovely. Here we go. I have one goal for today. I hope that by the end of this presentation, every single one of you will be able to leave and actually make better charts and graphs. So we're not going to be, you know, inspiring anyone with things or theoretically divagating upon it. We're going to try to look for actual solutions that you can start implementing like today and tomorrow. The agenda is first, why actually bother and why chart and graph and all kinds of data visualization accessibility is important. Just a few words, some potentially non-obvious points for some of you. Next, what are the main accessibility issues? And what kind of accessibility solutions are required from the web content accessibility guidelines? Spoiler alert, not many. Many things are only in the realm of best practice. And then comes the main part of the presentation, which is six different chapters, each one considering specific aspects of chart and visualization accessibility. So we'll start with some color schemes. Oh, excuse me, first shapes and sizes, the obvious. Then we'll go to color schemes. Next, various map keys and chart legends, followed by values and labels and how to show them on a, on a graph. Before the last, borders and spacing, as something quite underrated, but with an amazing potential. And to conclude, a little bit about summaries and various descriptions. So, let's go. First, first things first, why bother? Well, obviously, data science is a growing sector of ICT, right? I wish I could be a data scientist. I'm still lacking a little bit in the R programming department for that, but data science is here, is here to stay, and more often than not, we, as UX designers, are going to have to cope with it. You know, right now, when everything is so data-driven and we want to give personalized data to every single user, well, someone has to display it. And displaying data using a simple Excel bar chart isn't really enough anymore, right? It's not in line with user expectations. So we know why, but why is there a problem with it? Well, the main problem with charts and graphs is actually accessibility. Charts, graphs, anything you just insert uh, into your web page, web application, which is purely visual, they're most frankly completely inaccessible. Like, I mean completely inaccessible. Carpet inaccessibility. So, the two main sectors of, uh, of users which have issues with these charts and graphs, it's a broad category of various low vision, uh, color blindness, full blindness. Uh, by the way, full blindness never means seeing black. It's, it's not like that. It usually means just seeing fuzzy shapes or smudges of color. That's, that's what full blindness usually means. So don't think that a blind person sees blackness everywhere. It's just not true usually. Uh, anyway, even eye strain, like look around yourselves, how many of us are wearing glasses? It's not gonna get any better from here, we're getting older. Uh, eye limitations, eye fatigue, eye strain, it's also an accessibility issue. It's temporary, true, but it is an accessibility issue. So this is the first group, various visual impairments of varying extent. Now, second thing is various cognitive or intellectual impairment. Now, intellectual impairment is 
usually, you know, inborn, innate, uh, it just happens and we have to cope with it. However, cognitive disability, cognitive impairment is something that it comes to all of us with time. So, uh, you know, we're in the age average of, I don't know, under 40 probably here, right? But give us 20 years, give us 25 years. When we hit 65 or 70, pretty much most of us are going to feel some kind of signs of cognitive aging. You know, smaller, bigger, perhaps problems with uh, working memory. We won't be able to do so many things at once. Perhaps we'll be a little worse at remembering. Perhaps we'll be a little worse at decision making or, amongst other things, interpreting data. Okay, so it's all an issue that should be, uh, should be counterbalanced by appropriately created graphs, which well, obviously won't solve all the problems, uh, because if you don't have a correctly described graph, it's just never going to be accessible to someone who's blind. But you could make your graphs and charts and maps and visualizations at least slightly more accessible for the people who need just a little bit of accessibility to function better. Now, what are the main accessibility issues? We already said there are two main accessibility uh, issue groups, one resulting in vision impairment of various sorts, one resulting in cognitive impairment of various sorts. So, obvious problem, color contrast. Yeah, color contrast is something that is not respected in the majority of charts and graphs on the internet. And I'm going to give you lots of pictures here in this presentation later on. Later on. They're all taken from the internet. Uh, quite a bit of them are pretty bad. Uh, and that's just, you know, the state of the art today. Our charts and graphs are pretty bad. So, uh, is color contrast actually expected of charts and graphs according to web content accessibility guidelines? No, because it's an image. We don't have to provide color contrast for every image. If we would, we should provide color contrast for every single photograph and painting. And obviously that's not happening, right? You know, we have artists and they won't agree to it. But visualizations, graphs, infographics, it's a pretty special type of image. And I truly and deeply believe as a low vision per a person with some color vision deficits as well, uh, that color contrast is something which can really improve the user experience drastically. Like choosing the appropriate colors for sectors of a, of a pie chart, okay? That's one thing. And then we have the whole cognitive impairment side of things. And here, look at, at what main issues we've got in graphs, distinguishing values and labels and, and variables, as well as understanding the insights that come from the graph. Now, this sounds a little bit abstract, but when you think about it, in case you have a graph which is hard to distinguish, People can't distinguish which variable is which, which values they present, or they have trouble gaining the right insights. Well, how on earth can you expect people to understand the content? Like, the graph is useless for many people. And I'm talking here cognitive disabilities, like, uh, like in elderly people. I'm also talking perhaps children as well. They, children, uh, teens, they may, while they're not fully formed yet, and you know, not perfectly uh, mature age and mature intellectually and at the height of one's brain performance, everyone who's outside this small little category may encounter accessibility issues in understanding what's on the graph, okay? So how much accessibility is actually absolutely required uh, according to web content accessibility guidelines? Well, barely anything. Like, I'm, you know, I'm not happy about the state of the art, but I understand why we can't, you know, expect everyone to give perfectly colored graphs. We have to provide alt text as for any other 
uh, image, Cole, who is pretty certain of writing good alt texts in their performance, okay? I'm not sure if, uh, if anyone dares to say, I write the perfect alternative text. Uh, okay, so one important thing, alternative text. We should all have them, we should all know how to compose them, but most of them, which we can find on the internet, just pretty much suck. Second thing, we should, uh, we should provide some supplementary data. So for, perhaps if we have a chart, we should also provide the same data using a table, a simple table, HTML table, a data table, something in your Word document. I'm not saying that blind users enjoy uh, tabbing through a table. It's quite horrible. Anyone who, uh, who's feeling inspired, please try to turn on a screen reader today in the evening and look at any table on the internet. It's not a fun experience, but at least it's, it's basically accessible to some point. So how to counter all this? And here, com here comes uh, the section where I'll be giving you quite concrete tips at the end of every little section. First, we choose the right type of graph. Graphs come in all shapes and sizes, okay? We have pie charts, we have bar charts, we have line charts, we have scatter plots. Uh, we may as well have, you know, these exotic chart types like spider web charts or some sort of accelerometer charts and so on. By the way, uh, I hope everyone's aware that there's usually a right and wrong uh, kind, of, kind of chart for every type of data, depending on what you're trying to say, okay? So if you can say something simply using a pie chart, perhaps uh, you have some percentages to show, and it's only a few categories, use the pie chart. It shows percentages up to 100, perfect. If you have various categories with absolute values or perhaps percentages which don't really sum up to 100, you know, in questionnaires that can be the case, use some sort of a bar chart, column chart, they'll be great for that. Don't try to use a spider web chart where you can use something simpler. Just, just don't. You have to have a reason for picking a chart type and the reason is definitely not because it's pretty. Try to remember that. By the way, uh, a spider web chart is pretty much just a column chart, only rounded. So, yeah, think twice before you, before you decide what chart type you, you take. Always try to take the simpler chart and have a very good reason for what you're going to choose. So, first two, two actionable insights. Second question, what colors or maybe even patterns we could use? Well. Now, this is the fun part. All this stuff is called, uh, it's, it's rain, rainbow color scales, okay? Very popular. I'm pretty sure most of you have seen rainbow color scales on various maps, uh, on other kinds of charts, perhaps uh, using some, some sort of a multi-level chart, uh, you know, when you have bars of various types in, uh, grouped together. But the issue with this, for most visually impaired people, is that the edges represent darker colors and the middle represents lighter colors, okay? If you're colorblind, by the way, colorblind is definitely not just, oh, I don't see red and green. That is not the case. You can have colorblind people who see red and green pretty fine, but they don't see blues. And if someone doesn't see, let's say, the blue pigment, you've got three pigments in your eye, RGB, that's why, you know, the stage name is RGB, by the way. Uh, so if you don't see the blue pigment, it doesn't mean that instead of blues, you see grays. Oh, no. You may see all blues as oranges or something like that. If you don't see, I don't know, the green pigment, perhaps, you will see greens as sort of reddish browns. There are lots of ways and no two colorblind people are the same. You can use the colorblind simulators you find online. Yeah, they're cool. Uh, you know, they don't represent everything, but they're, they're an idea to work with. Main point, rainbow scales are not the way to go. 
even though they're really pretty and you know they have a long legacy because we've used rainbow scales on most of the maps in the world for years. Uh, meaning, meaning that you know, red is high or good uh, or bad, and you know, blue or green is low or whatever. A variation on rainbow scales are, are some sort of composed palettes. You may have a palette full of pastel colors, of intense colors, an autumn palette, a spring palette, uh, great, beautiful, perfect for color contrast analysis and you know, things in the beauty sector, but not necessarily for accessibility. Same problem. If someone sees the second palette, like color two, color four, five, six, color seven, eight, they might be exactly the same color to a colorblind person. Okay? What can we use instead? We can use monochrome palettes. Yeah. Which, which are really easy because here the main distinction is lightness, not the color, not the shade. It's lightness, how light it is, how dark it is. These are pretty good options. You know, you can go from, I don't know, uh, white to light blue to medium cornflower blue to navy blue, and that shows the intensity of your parameter. Good way to go. And of course, there are patterns and textures. I know what you're thinking, I know. I see the looks on your faces. This is ugly. And I, and I can't really disagree. It's pretty ugly. Yeah, that's the point. But the thing is, if we've got several hundred UX designers here at this conference, I'm pretty sure we can really collectively work out a pretty way to use patterns or textures. Besides, ugly or not ugly, it definitely works. Obviously, it won't always work, because if you have uh, a chart in which you've got, you know, 30 levels, you can't figure out 30, 30 different patterns, right? But it's a good way to go. So the digest from this bit is first, uh, try to avoid rainbow palettes. Try using perhaps a monochrome palette instead. You can always use patterns as much as you, as much as you like. They're more accessible. Not always, because you know the patterns have to differ as well, but it's a good option. And something I must, uh, I must remind you of, although color contrast uh, concerns text strictly, if you have any text on top of any kind of colored sector within the graph, it would be good practice to give it enough color contrast as well. So your low vision users or elderly users can make it out. Next. Keys and legends. So a key, a map key, or a legend, is the little bitty box you put beside the map at, at the bottom or top of a map or, or other data visualization, which tells us what is what. Now, I'm going to give you three examples of different map keys. Ah, oh, God. I'm running out of stage here, but I hope you'll be able to see them all. Now, what are the differences between them? First set on the left. Pretty standard, we've got ver uh, the variable names, the labels, from top to bottom. And to the left of them, we've got little patches uh, with samples of the color that this label is combined with, okay? In the middle, same situation, except the sample areas are much bigger. They're, have a look, they're even bigger than the line height of the font. In the third example, we've got, as in the second, so okay, big samples, but additionally, we've got some percentages. These may be total percentage of something within the graph. Now, a question over to you. Who thinks that the first uh, idea for a legend is best? Okay, hands up. Not much. The lights here are, are really intense. I must say, I barely see you. Uh, who thinks the middle one is best? Hands up. Yeah, I know I asked the biased question. The, uh, who thinks the third one is best? Okay, so I'll tell you the, the correct answer is number three is best. Why? Because that's the crucial question, why? Well, by ways of elimination, number one is bad because the little sample of the color is too small. Why is that an issue? Because if you have low vision users, sometimes they take issue with 
distinguishing a color for something small, but when you give them something bigger, where they have a bigger color sample, it's easier for them to make out the differences between the colors. Like, really, it works like that. It shouldn't work like that, but it does work exactly that way. It's, it's a combination of having slightly uh, impaired color vision and slightly impaired uh, visual uh, acuity. Okay? So a combination of that makes distinguishing the color of a bigger object relatively easier to distinguishing the color of a tiny object. So obviously, number one, bad. But why is number three better than number two? Because in case of someone who has total color blindness, uh, well, in the second legend, they still have to try to make the connection between label and something on the graph on their own. And in number three, they don't. That's one. That's uh, the argument for the visually impaired people. But there's also an argument for the people who are cognitively impaired. If someone is cognitively impaired, look, look what you're forcing them to do using version two. Like if it's an algorithm, what are they going to do in their heads? Find the label you're interested in. Understand which color it's connected to. Let's say I'm interested in C. Uh, understand which color you're interested in. Okay, here's the color for C. Now, look at the main graph and find the color appropriate for C. Like, do you see how many cognitive steps there are there? And on the other hand, if you use the third version with these percentages, it's only find the appropriate label. Read the result. Two steps less. It's an amazing solution. I wish more people used it, because you know, it's very uncommon pretty, uh, for now. So combining all this information, uh, provide values if possible. Won't always be possible, but if it is possible, do try. Provide as large a color sample as you can fit into the uh, UI looking reasonably well. Okay. By the way, squares are, square samples are better than round sam samples because the area of a square is simply more than the area of a circle with the same radius, right? Obvious. And another good idea is to try to give some color contrast between the adjacent colors. Adjacent meaning that between A and B, we try to get enough color contrast for it to be at least, you know, three, three to one difference between B and C and so on. That makes it easier when someone's using a graph uh, and he has the adjacent colors, for instance, in a pie chart. A pie chart is somewhere is something where we start at 12 and the first sector will be color A, the second will be color B, the third will be color C. So if we have the adjacent colors different, it's easier to make out where color A ends and color B begins. Okay? Next part, values and labels. Now this is a tricky one and uh, this is one of the situations I feel it's sometimes pretty hopeless because not everything can be shown properly. But most often, we'll have a problem with, with showing values uh, for line charts, okay? You have line charts, you have them colored, as in the left. You have little shapes on the lines, perhaps. You may have some labels and a very interesting solution. You may have both a label at the end of the line and value, values marked in some way within the line. Now, Version 4, great idea, because it shows you both the key data points here marked as the little variables, uh, as, as little values, and you know which variable is which as you have a label. It's a great idea. Like, you can go for it. Problem starts when we have too many crisscrossing lines. You know, think uh, stock prices where you have very many data points. Or perhaps if you have comparisons of, I don't know, GDP for all the EU countries. You know, you've got 20, 20 something different lines crossing each other for each year and it gets really complex. And there's no good accessible solution to that that I've thought of yet. But I'm working on it. You know, you should probably divide it into several graphs, which isn't always ideal, but it's a way to go. You can have the, sa the same question for other types of graphs, not only line graphs. Why not display the values within a bar chart, within a pie chart? It really helps. 
It's one of the ways that can make it easier for others. Even better, why not use connector lines to, co to connect a label and a value to a specific region within a chart? This is you know, pretty much uh, as good as you, you can go. It's really great. Obviously, no keyboard access, so, uh, so a blind user still needs an accessible text, an alternative text. But for everyone else, like low vision, cognitive impairment, this is pretty good. It's, it's really a pretty good thing, and I think this should become standard. Uh, if you're feeling very creative, I've seen such crazy solutions where you have a pie chart with larger labels for the more numerous categories. I'm not saying this is accessible, but if you're looking for something really interesting, I guess you could go that way as well. It's better than, uh, than not having the labels at all, definitely. Okay, so key points here. Labels, do have them. Values, do try to enhance them by pointing them out. Uh, you, can, you can try to use uh, methods to enhance the key values, like a little dot, perhaps writing the value in the label next, next to uh, some sort of a variable. It's all pretty good. Visually connecting labels, also a great idea. We're going to the end, let's see how am I, oh my God, I still have so much time. Great, probably means I'm talking way too fast for you, but okay. We'll have questions at the end, if anything's unclear. This is the second to last item I'd like to talk to you about. It's borders and spacing. Now, UX designers have Many ideas about borders, you know, they should be a certain way to look visually uh, correct and so on. But the thing is, you can use both borders and spacing between regions within a graph or chart to, to improve accessibility. It's really underrated. No one, well, barely anyone uses this method. And it's really great. Now, have a look at all these sample pie charts. Uh, for someone with visual impairment, for someone using their screen or computer in, uh, you know, well, so much light as we have here on the stage, perhaps, in tough conditions, with eye fatigue, this is illegible. Like, you can't see very well where the first color ends, the second one begins. Okay? This is the problem. Everything mixes and mashes together and you're not really sure which color is color, color one, which one is color two. Now, what you could do is perhaps slightly separate the regions. Okay, so you have some spacing between regions or maybe you could try to add thicker borders. And yes, I know these borders are very thick and pretty hideous, objectively, but I'm absolutely sure you can find a more aesthetically pleasing way to do this. You've probably not noticed I'm not much of a UI person. You know, I'm like accessibility, UX research, I leave the pretty graphics to someone else. But the key, uh, key aspect here is like find a way to, to make it visually ple pleasing and accessible at the same time. I'm just saying thicker borders may be really helpful, okay? You can use this for other uh, chart types as well. It's like every kind of bar chart, column chart, that's cool. You can also add thicker borders. Perhaps they don't have to be as thick and clumsy as the example uh, on the right, but it's a really good way to go. Now, key insights, use borders. Use spacing to your advantage. If you space things a little bit, it's far easier for both uh, visually impaired people and cognitively impaired people to distinguish where one sector ends, where the other one begins. This is really important. So uh, have a look, uh, look at this and try to figure out a good way in your project. And perhaps one more, one more thing, also remember about trying to keep a contrast ratio between adjacent colors, not between all the colors in the palette, because that's pretty, pretty much not gonna happen. I once tried to make a you know, co color palette where you had at least three or, or four uh, color contrast difference between all colors between each other, won't happen. 
okay? But between the adjacent ones, at least, that makes it much easier to work with. Last but not least, summaries and descriptions. Now, as far as summaries and descriptions go, first thing, you should already have them as Web Content Accessibility Guidelines require you to add some sort of an alternative text to your charts and graphs as to any other image. So you should already have the summary, okay? An alt text could be a summary. A summary could be used as an alt text. Uh, well, you know, keep it concise and uh, don't include useless words within the summary, such as the blue bar uh, in the 3D graph represents something. No, a good alt text or summary is that variable A has value X. You don't need to say what color the bar is, uh, what shape the graph is. Well, you know, you, can, you could say the shape of the graph if you really want, but giving information such as this is a 3D bar chart or column chart or a 2D column chart really doesn't help anyone. It's, it's useless for accessibility. Uh, okay, there are two ways, uh, at least in Poland, there are two sides to writing alternative text. Uh, some Blind users are for one way, some are for the other. Uh, there is, you know, an ongoing issue here, but pretty much uh, you should go for content first, always, okay? Content means the value and the variable. That's the basics. You don't really need to talk about the visual aspects of your wonderful graphic. So that's, uh, that's aspect number one. You should also provide some sort of a data table because that's required, you know? It should be perhaps not flat on your face on the web page, but under, underneath some sort of link, link to somewhere, that's a good idea. Now, the alternative text must be image oriented, okay? And the last one, provide a brief summary with key insights. Now, I'm underlining this brief summary and key insights. Why? Well, if you provide this summary within the main text, and I know not always you're going to have some main text, right? Sometimes you're just going to have a mobile app which shows a graphic and not much more, right? But if you have some text around your data visualization, perhaps in an article, a blog post, uh, on some, some sort of desktop, okay? Just look for an idea and a place to add an appropriate summary, if only possible. If the data is user-generated, well, you won't have a summary. But if the da data is yours, try to add the summary or description. What could you say there? Well, do you remember uh, your preschool, no, not preschool, uh, primary school textbooks? Quite often, you had some sort of a table, a chart, and beneath it, in the, in the main text of the book, everything was explained. Because, you know, you have to teach children how to understand data. You can't just show them a graph. You tell them, and the, the graph here shows that this happens here and this happens there, and this variable increased uh, in these years, and there is a trend of such and so. Okay? This is the kind of description or summary, which is absolutely amazing for accessibility. And it could even substitute an alternative text. And you could consider the graph itself just, you know, purely decorative cult, uh, content with an alt text of nothing, you know, empty alt text. Yeah? You see my point. If you have a good summary, then the graph, it's only an, an image to make everything look pretty. It's not the key anymore. And for cognitive disabilities, for children, for seniors, for intellectually disabled people, uh, this is a great solution. Because even if someone doesn't have the capabilities to interpret the, the data themselves right now, they can just read your summary. You need two, three sentences to make everything perfectly clear for all of your audience. Okay? So I know this sounds pretty crude, and you as a UX designer don't really want to do this, you can tell your UX writers or, uh, or your business partners that they should figure out how to do this bit. 
because you know it's sort of <laughs> their part. You, you don't have to write these summaries on your own. But it's a good idea just to keep them intact within the text. It's just going to help a whole bunch of people you wouldn't even expect may have a problem. Because perhaps some visual impairments are visible, but cognitive impairments usually isn't. And that's pretty much what I had prepared for you for today. Hopefully, you'll be able to get some insights and actually, well, create better graphs for the future because there's no escaping from data science. Like, it's all around, we're going to have more and more. And, well, it would be really nice if we wouldn't exclude enormous sectors of the population, like, you know, elderly people, that's 20, 30% of the population, from taking part in this data revolution. So thank you very much, and I await your questions. Well, thank you, Dorota. That was a really great presentation. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Okay, we have. Hey, thank you for your presentation. I really like the part about uh, the tables and the insights. Uh, me as a data analyst, I always provide them as they are. I mean, the insight is crucial in here, as you mentioned that. Exactly. And, and uh, the other thing is that um, stakeholders like to dodge into the data and you know, dwell there themselves. But my question is regarding these monochromatic scales. Uh, I wonder, like, isn't there an accessibility issue in contrast? Because if you go like lighter and lighter oh, shade, yeah? Yeah, that's a great question. Wait, I'll go back to the slide. And I was actually meaning to say this when I practiced the presentation three days ago, but uh, I forgot. So yeah, thank you for the question. No problem. My error. Okay, here we go. Oopsie, here we go. Okay, so obviously, Adjacent colors on these scales do not have large differences in contrast. Is this an issue? Yes and no. Now, it depends, you know, being a good UX, I have to say it depends at least once during a presentation, right? Uh, so, if you are using such a scale, so monochrome, many shades, something about 10 shades or so, on a map-like visualization. Map-like in the sense that you have many regions, you know, uh, imagine an administrative map of the country, okay? So you have many little regions, many vo voivodeships or whatever, and, uh, you know, the colors, it is quite probable that you will have a place where shade two is right next to shade three. Yeah, and that's a pretty hopeless situation. Perfectly agree. Here you could work with patterns, you could work with numbering the shades or whatnot. But for many other applications, like uh, when, when you have this map and your user doesn't really need to know the very specific value. He just needs to get, at a glance, a pretty good estimate of what uh, intensity some parameter appears then this is good enough because if I'm low vision, just, well, I am low vision, but you get the point. Uh, if I see something's very light, I'm not sure whether it's this color or, or this second color, but I know it's very light, so I have very low intensity of the parameter. If I see something is very dark, which could be one of the last two, perhaps last three, I know that there's a lot of something in this region. If I see that something's more or less in the middle, I'm not sure whether it's this color, this or the next one. I don't know which one, but I have an estimate of more or less where I'm going with it. So yeah, answering your question, yes and no. No, it's not foolproof, but it does give you a rough estimate, which more often than not will be pretty much enough for the user's application. All right, so to follow up on my friend's question, uh, I wanted to ask, what if you have to uh, use some specific distinctive values, then would you use some of the schemes that you've shown, like the ones with really contrasting colors, especially, like you said, with the adjacent ones being uh, different, like having a uh, better contrast? I'd use a data table. All right. <laughs> uh, like, I'm sorry, but there's only so much you can work with in graphs. 
It's just colors. It's gonna be colors, it's gonna be visual. If someone, if someone is totally unvisual, like being blind or close to blind, like you're not going to save them using color. It just won't happen. Data tables are foolproof, and we should think of, of data presentation like in a completely different way. First, we think, what are the insights? Do we need precise data for the user or just a rough estimate? Then we think, okay, if the data table, because we need precise data, is complex, ugly, and unattractive, do we need a, some supplementary material for perhaps less professional users as well? Uh, or users who will get scared off seeing the data table? Uh, so we can create a nice little graph for those people, which is purely decorative content, basically, because all, the, all that matters is already in the data table. Like, looking for other strange and fun solutions I've seen on the web, uh, I've seen solutions where you can, for instance, use uh, interactive graphs. Yeah, so you hover on some sort of an area and you get some extra, mm, extra information. Obviously, ho hovers are never good for accessibility because, you know, not keyboard accessible and often and so on. Uh, so your blind user will probably still stick with the data table. But for a visually impaired user, like on hover, extra information, great idea. Like, why not? Go with it. Try with it. Experiment. All right, thank you so much. Do we have another question? Yeah. Suhaj? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dorota, for uh, the presentation. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm, my question is, uh, will not consider, let's say, the, the colors. I just wanted to ask regarding let's say, uh, focus on the element, especially when you are using a uh, keyboard for those who are visually impaired. <laughs> let's say we have a bar chart um, with, you know, different data and so on, and we have a focus on this SVG image with the bar chart. So let's say the alternative text should be um, a bar chart that is representing, let's say, age range of the number of participants at WaysConf, and uh, then... But, but that's a useless data. bar chart. So, Like, if, yeah. if your alt text is bar chart representing whatever, mm -hmm. like, this gives me absolutely no information. What I want to hear when I'm blind, blind, not visually impaired, okay, really blind, that I can't see at all, uh, is, well, if it's a bar chart, that's optional, but... Uh, 20% of users are between ages 18 and 25. 30% of users are between ages 26 and 55. That's, that's the data. Like, the important thing in your visualization, it's not the colors, it's not the shape, it's not the size, it's the data. Variable name and variable value. That's all you need. What you said, uh, that is, uh, graph representing, bar chart representing what not, that's what you write as a title of a figure, right? That's exactly what you should have as the title of the figure, but not as the alt text. Okay, so uh, if we, I would have a title, let's say, of the bar chart, should it also be like um, uh, used with voiceover? You know, the, for example, the person that it um, uh, uses assistive technology, doesn't mix, you know, the data and the chart. Just the, the whole content, the data will be in one place, right? Especially we have, if we have a lot of numbers. You can do it pretty much any way you like, as long as it always, all together, it gives the right idea. So if you prefer to make just the graph only a decorative element and describe everything else within a summary and so on, it's okay. If you have a title, like a figure title, which is in plain text, well then obviously you don't have to put that stuff in the alternative text, because it's already text, and so on. Like, if you come to me, we can discuss further, because I, okay, I, I sense this is something I should see to answer, you know, uh, complexly.